take number 1028. Gosh, I hope we get it right this time because it's a very auspicious number if you like to study the Veda, specifically the Rig Veda. But that's not the only Veda that's out there. And why would you care? Well, because you're already here. And something about the Vedas made you interested. Maybe it was an ancient Bronze Age civilization and all of its powerful influences on the time that came later. Or maybe it's like, oh, I just have a junkie for poetry and I got to get my fix. Or maybe you're into political ritual and want to see how different times and places might give us better insight into our own world. Well, then you've come to the right place because here in Vedic Sanskrit, you're going to learn all those things. At least the beginnings of all those things. Now, the problem with Vedic Sanskrit, as you might have imagined, is that it's not like normal Sanskrit, which you might call classical Sanskrit. I don't mean to denigrate it. But Vedic Sanskrit has many expressive dimensions that classical Sanskrit has lost because it was a spoken language and not an erudite, precise one uh, perfected by the grammarian Panini. So, in many ways, when we talk about Vedic Sanskrit, we should probably talk about Vedic Sanskrits because it's a dynamic language that changes over time and space and predates the grammatical tradition. That can make it kind of hard to talk about because we don't have native grammarian inventory of terms to use, or when we do use them, they don't exactly quite properly fit. So we'll have to borrow a couple things from the world of uh, historical linguistics, but I think we can make a cracking good chance of it. And uh, in this nine-week module, you'll get to learn the entirety of the Vedic grammar. Um, however, I should give you the caveat that Vedic grammar is very big and diverse. The best way to encounter it is in the text, when you can say, oh, I had no idea that this thing existed. And I'd say, no, well, that's great, because it's the only time it will ever happen in all of the, the Vedas. And that's sometimes what it's like. So what we'll be doing is giving a, you'll go, well, let's get into the actual, uh, into the actual visuals. All right, how do I do this? All right, here we go. Now, that's, I need to make you see what I see. Uh, voila. All right, so um, this is a nine-week course. It has nine modules. The first module is Vedic verb morphology. The verb is very different in the Vedas. Uh, things that you learned is just like some weird thing we have to memorize. Perfect stems and aorist stems and things like the subjunctive and the injunctive and all sorts of crazy usages. Well, those are all really important and they all mean different things. And you're going to find out how to use them and how to read them more importantly. Um, at this time, because it's the beginning of the course, I like to give a little context about what the heck are the Vedas. Uh, and why the heck they were important, and how the heck we even have access to them today. Uh, week two, we're going to go through nominal morphology. Now, the good news is nominal morphology for the Vedic materials is considerably less complex than the verbal morphology. It's not a total re uh, revolution uh, of what you're used to, um, but it does have some peculiarities. And in many ways, nominal declension, you got to be careful because different nouns decline differently based off the accent. You know that classical Sanskrit has no accent, but Vedic Sanskrit very much has an accent, and the accent matters. It often has uh, grammatical consequences, um, of which we'll see many examples. And then finally, we'll read our first Vedic text. Well, it's, it's, it's a very late Vedic text, and when you read it, you might say, hey, this is basically classical. I can do this, and that's the whole point. But I, I introduce it for another reason. One, most people think the oldest Upanishad is the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad or the Chandogya Upanishad. But there's a text that so that slightly predates both called the Jaimaniya Upanishad Brahmana. And it's a really interesting text. It's under understudied. Um, and we're going to look at the very beginning of it because it gives an origin of the Vedas. Here's something interesting about the Vedas, which we'll go over again on, on, on day one. That is... For a certain group of people in the classical period of, of South Asia, of ancient India, the Vedas were timeless, authorless. And because of that, because they emanated from the cosmos as sort of a unified whole, um, we couldn't necessarily say, oh, the Rig Veda is older than those other Vedas. This is whatever, you know. There was no relative chronology. Now, you'll find when we look at text, we often can't reconstruct the external history. That is, what year and what time did, was this text created? 
But it sometimes is very possible to construct an internal history, that is a relative chronology of texts to one another. And this is just what Orientalist scholars in the late 19th century did. They looked at these texts and said, hey, this one looks a little more linguistically archaic than that one looks a little linguistically younger. Well, from that perspective, the Jaimini Upanishad Brahmana, hence Job 1.1, looks very young, but it's already got its own origins for the Vedas. So instead of going with the origin that the Orientalists would have us understand, or the one that Mimamsakas from the classical period would have us believe, because that's also just an opinion that came after the Vedic period by millennia. What if we turn to the texts themselves to see what kind of origin they imagine for themselves? So that's going to be a, a, a continuous theme throughout the material. Module three, we start reading Middle Vedic prose. Now, if you're into Indo-European, this is some of the oldest prose in all of Indo-European. It's paratactic which means it's going to be pretty easy to read in terms of syntax, but there may often be words and forms we don't know. So we'll have still have to be careful. We're going to read the story of Sarama and the Panis and Kururavas and Urvashi. Now, this is a very interesting one because in Kururavas and Urvashi, it's, a, it's already retelling a story that appears in the Rig Veda, a much older version, and already it's very difficult. So they provide the Rig Vedic verse, which you at this time would not have to translate, and then they translate that into a little more simple middle Vedic period version. So by looking at the two, you can understand the more archaic one better. And what we have here in many ways is our first poetic commentary. So that's an interesting text too. Okay, now we get into the earliest prose of all. This is the prose that's embedded in the actual Samhita or primary um, performative utterance collection of the Black Yajurveda. So we're going to see two tales, the creation of night and Manu's cups. These are fun ones, and they've got lots of ritual dimensions, and we'll talk about why that is. Uh, in module five, we're going to start looking at metrical compositions, that is, texts in meter. We'll look at the Vulgate of the Atarva Veda, that is primarily the Shaunaka, but it's roughly the same as the other recension, the Paipalada. We've got a bunch of short texts. You see, this is a lot you, what we see right here is a lot of different texts, but they're all about four verses long. These are what we might call colloquially spells, incantations, prophylactics in the ancient sense. Um, and I want to look at a little part of the Samaveda. Now, the Samaveda is also very understudied when we, when you, especially for students just being introduced to the Vedas. Uh, no one looks at the Samaveda. Uh, because people will tell you, oh, it's just the Rig Veda in a different order and just study the Rig Veda. Well, most of that's true, but the fact that it's in a different order is interesting. We can talk about why that might be. But there are also verses that are unique to the Samba Veda, and it leaves us wondering, when were these created? For what reason? Did they once belong to the Rig Veda and were excluded, or are they original compositions of the Samba Veda? So we're going to dive in and look at some of the unique material in the oldest parts of the Samba Veda, and we'll talk a little bit about what this is. Um, module six, the longer metrical composition in the Atarva Veda. So here we'll talk about some features of the Atarva Veda that are really more relevant to the Rig Veda. A lot of Rig Vedic stuff, style of the more complex, what we might call the high register poetry. And we'll have uh, an example, one of the earliest, um, what we might call Shiva poetry. It's begging the terrifying deity, Rudra, to be Shiva, that is to be civil to us. Okay. Module seven. Now we get into the sort of harder parts of these texts. We're going to dive into Rig Vedic texts, but don't worry. We'll start off with some relatively simpler ones, the story of Yama and Yami, and the story of Sarama and the Panis. Now you might remember Sarama and the Panis from earlier. That's right. We're going to see an earlier version of the same narrative, and that's going to let you track conceptually how things have changed over time. Um, Yama and Yami is also a story that you've actually been exposed to. I won't give you any spoiler alerts, but remember way back in module uh, four, the creation of night, this is linked to the story of Yama and Yami. Okay, then the things that are most famous in the Rig Veda, the cosmogonic deeds of Indra. Each one of these hymns is about one of them. There are two primary ones. Uh, we'll get into the details of it, but this is heroic, over-the-top, bombastic, hyperbolic, heroic poetry. And I've said heroic twice. Finally, we'll close it out with some of the really hard stuff, the Rig Veda. This is the great stuff, because there are many places where I get to say, I don't know, or your guess is as good as mine. These are the mysteries that continue to elude us. 
the Vedas are still very much beyond our ken. And although we understand lots of things, we certainly don't understand everything. And there are many things we're not even close to understanding. So we'll get to look at some of the hymns that don't seem to have necessarily a direct ritual application, or they're full of riddles or different stylistic techniques like poetic repair and the omphalos. Um, here is also the first time I'm going to give you a couple academic articles to read so that you're not just learning a language and reading text, but now you're going to be able to find that you actually know how to read and engage with scholarship on the Vedas. Uh, we'll read one very famous poem, The Primordial Man, and then I want to talk a little bit about riddles, uh, a special type of ritual riddle called the Brahmodia and the so-called uh, what, what my old teacher, Jerry Klein, always called the Festival of Interrogatives. That is a certain type, uh, a stylistic form of the poem, which asks a bunch of questions and then answers those questions. OK, so great. I'll see you in July. Uh, anything that I wanted to close with? Uh, I'm moving. You're actually sitting right now on a stack of books. Yay high. Well, not yay high, but sufficiently high to hold this up uh, because it was far more stable than my wobbly table. But don't worry. I'll soon be moving to some much more uh, stable digs. And, and boy, oh boy, are they up. Uh, oh, I never closed this thing. So you're no, not looking at my face directly. And you should. You should always look directly into the eyes of your teacher and say, that's all I can take. I can't take no more. Goodbye.